welcome all of you to this session, which is not quite originally as advertised. What was going to be the case was that James, as a distinguished former editor of the Times, was going to interview Sir Harry Evans as another distinguished former editor of the Times. Um, sadly, uh, Sir Harry's under the weather and can't be with us. So um, James, as a distinguished former editor of the Times, <laughs> will be asked a few questions by me, an undistinguished, indeed disgraced, uh, former, <laughs> former assistant editor of the Times. Uh, but um, I'll be talking uh, from my particular perspective as a politician who's been a journalist, and James will be able to tell us a little bit more about life as a journalist who's had to put up with some outrageous behaviour on the part of politicians. <laughs> but one of, the, one of the first things I know that um, uh, James was anxious that we talk about was the impact on all our lives, media and political, of the Donald Trump phenomenon. James. Uh, well, Michael, thank you very much, and thank you all. Uh, I know Harry would have loved to have been here. Um, just to give you a sense of the uh, awkwardness and delight of this particular encounter is that Michael, amongst his many other uh, uh, qualifications for doing the things he's done, was the news editor of The Times. And if you know anything about newsrooms, news editors are famously the most irascible, short-tempered, and foul-mouthed creatures. And so when Michael was appointed the news editor of The Times, he didn't exactly fit the bill, because he has um, an external um, uh, characteristic, which is calm, extremely polite, respectful, and courteous. And his inner personality is exactly the same. And yeah. people were very surprised that he had been put in charge of the newsroom. And um, one of the great ironies of the 2015 general election was that Ed Miliband's sort of chief communications director and uh, 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 strategic advisor was, of course, Tom Baldwin, who'd been the political editor uh, when, um, uh, when Michael was the news editor. And Tom would always tell these wonderful stories about, uh, about Michael being news editor. When the copy was late, it was a complete mess. It was 9.45, the paper needed to go 15 minutes ago. And the phone would ring in the lobby and Tom Baldwin would pick up the phone and he would shout, yes! And on the end of the phone would be, hello Tom, it's Michael. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> <laughs> And so when we found ourselves in a spot, um, I, I called Michael and said, can you do this uh, with me? And he said, yes, of course. And so I'm extremely grateful to you, Michael, to, to, for doing it. So listen, my, the reason I wanted to get into Trump right to begin with is because, of course, you know, the, in many ways, he is someone who is defining, or if you like, redefining, the whole issue of trust mm. at that intersection of business of, um, of journalism and politics. It's exactly the issue. I think you know, uh, uh, I'm a journalist. You're a politician. Mm. You know, we vie for uh, uh, being the most reviled uh, mm. um, uh, 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 characters in the public square today, and so. I thought that Trump is really interesting because, mm. because I don't know how many people were in the last session. There was a really interesting point that was made about Lenin as the godfather of post-truth yes. politics. And actually trying to understand the nature of truth and facts mm. and in the age of Trump. And I thought it's worth starting there because, of course, you've interviewed him. Mm. You famously came out of the interview with that... Thumbs up. Thumbs up. I thought it'd be good to start with where you would put that thumb, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> a few months later. What well, do you... What, well, what, one of the things that I mentioned at the time of the interview um, is that, um, uh, I, I, like everyone else, I uh, underestimated Trump's ability to get elected. I, I thought it was simply impossible because he was breaking all the conventional rules of politics. And I thought that um, when he said that uh, John McCain uh, a previous Republican uh, candidate and also someone who'd spent uh, years as a prisoner of war in Hanoi because he'd been a Navy pilot. When he said that John McCain couldn't be a real hero because real heroes don't get captured. <laughs> and he'd never done any military service himself. I thought, well, that's it. And then when he said, I could literally shoot one of my supporters on Fifth Avenue and still they would love me, I thought, it's one thing to be arrogant. It's another thing to advertise your arrogance in this way. Surely the, the, the bubble has to be pricked at that point and people will realize the magic carpet ride that you're taking them on. But no. And then 
Um, I visited um, uh, America uh, during the, the final week of the election. I went to a Trump rally and a Hillary rally. And a worm of doubt began to creep in because the Hillary rally was incredibly well designed, manicured and all the rest of it. The Trump rally uh, had, however, an electric energy to it. And I did think, mm, he might just pull it off. But actually I thought, no, you can get, you know, a few thousand people in any state. And if you provide them with free beer, free food, and, and what is basically a circus show, they will turn up. So I'm sure he could do it. So I was surprised, um, as amazed as anyone, when he was elected. And then when I met him, um, it wasn't that there was any sort of sudden revelation, but certain things that people had observed about him did click. And uh, there's a line, I can't remember which journalist was the first to coin it, who said that um, Trump's uh, supporters take him seriously, but not literally, whereas his critics take him literally, but not seriously. And one of the most surprising statistics about the election is the extent to which Trump was considered to be honest by people, even as they would acknowledge that he would state bald untruths in the course of any speech. And the honesty there was, for his supporters, the fact that he didn't, as they see it, uh, cave in to the political correctness and the clipped formulations that other politicians always do. So, um, as you all know, um, the, the tendency in television and broadcast news has been to shorten the length of time that any individual says anything during a bulletin. So politicians have shorter and shorter sound bites, and they work harder and harder in order to make sure that those sound bites are repeated on every available um, uh, channel, and they work harder and harder not to go off message. Hence the situation we had when Ed Miliband was famously interviewed, asked um, uh, lots of different questions, and repeated the same thing every time. When you see the footage of him repeating the same answer 10 times, he looks idiotic and robotic. But in fact, that's what all of us politicians actually do when we're asked those questions, because we know that we mustn't go off piste. Trump had none of that. He was um, uh, unbuttoned. He didn't care to whom he gave offense. And the fact that he did so was a liberation for lots of Americans who felt at last I have someone who feels the same sense of frustration that my, my language is policed and that my views are, are not taken legitimately. And therefore, his honesty was nothing to do with his uh, uh, track record of truth-telling. It was everything to do with the directness of expression, what we would have called, um, what a Yorkshireman would call calling a spade a spade. He did um, uh, in spades. Um, but one other thing I would say about him when you meet him is that... Um, uh, he is a um, raging, uh, remarkable, um, and what's the word? Uh, <laughs> impossible to stop, there are many words. <laughs> Force of nature. You know, one of the things about the interview is that there was a torrent of words. I was there with, a, as you know, a very experienced German editor, uh, the editor who built their, their best-selling newspaper. And we didn't really need to ask questions. Our questions were basically uh, opportunities for him to draw breath or to find something else <laughs> on which he was going to expatiate. And he, he had his own agenda. And this was the, the final thing that I would say. Looking back at the transcript, one of the things that was clear is that even though there were some remarkable detours on, 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 along the way, he had certain messages that he wanted to get out about German car manufacturers, about the European Union, mm. about uh, well, what his agenda for the presidency would be, mm. and in his own peculiar way he did. And you, and you were there with Rupert Murdoch. Rupert yes. was there. Yes. Did he talk? One of the things that was never been clear to me, was it a sort of round table in which no. he was involved? No. The, 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 the interview uh, occurred because... Um, uh, I had suggested to a particular executive in News Corps that um, we should just ask. You know, that, um, um, the, 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 the classic journalistic uh, principle, shy bairns get no sweeties. I thought, <laughs> why don't we just say, you know, Would why I... don't you do an interview with the London Times? Yeah. Um, and then, uh, thanks to the good influence of our proprietor, uh, he was able to open that door and uh, we walked in. But it was Trump's own team that said, we also wanted to have someone from a German newspaper there as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, they wanted to get their message into uh, 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 continental Europe as well as mm. uh, through the, me the medium of the Times. It's, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? You know, that, that week, I was in the States too, mm. that week beforehand. And um, I have to confess, I ended up speaking to editors of papers mm. like the Washington 
Post, the head of NPR, the whole run of uh, different journalistic outfits, all of whom were talking about the Trump surge and all of yeah. whom were saying that Hillary was going to win. And I had the same sort of sneaking suspicion, not least on the back of the EU referendum. Mm. And, and it, was a really, it was a really dumb and simplistic one, which was, look at their slogans. Look at mm. Stronger Together versus Make America Great Again. Mm. And the thing that's curious about our, sort, our willingness to deride a politics that is tempted into sound bites mm. and repetitions of 140 word statements is that of course when you can condense your political message into something that is extremely powerful and effective mm. it probably tells you something not just about your skills as a politician but also about the mood of the country and I think there's something here Michael that I'm not sure we've entirely taken on board about Donald Trump mm. which is I'm sure happening in our politics is that he has a capacity to address cultural questions with cultural answers. Yep. We often, I think, in our politics are seeing people addressing cultural questions with economic answers. Mm. Right? So if there is a sense that um, uh, you know, uh, Britain is not the country that it once was, a debate can go about, about the economic answer to that problem, uh, whereas some of them are really deeply cultural. And I just wanted to talk to you for a minute about taking the knee. Mm. I think this, I think this has become really interesting. There's a there's a there's a suspicion. You know, um, mm. newsrooms and journalists are are quite prone to skepticism. There's a suspicion that what you see with Trump is that when an element of his particularly domestic agenda, because it's the domestic reform mm. agenda that has been so stymied on Capitol Hill, when it runs aground, he'll he'll pull the cultural agenda lever. And nothing has been more extraordinary, to my mind, than this question of uh, picking a fight with some very physically, not to mention reputationally, mm. big people in the NFL about the issue of taking the knee, mm. rather than standing for the national anthem, going down on one knee to protest injustice, particularly mm. racial injustice in the United States. And I just wondered what you think of that in the UK. Because mm. we haven't got there yet, but I wouldn't be surprised that we will see a moment when someone chooses to have that argument mm. in the UK. And what, would, what is the political reaction? What's the nature of the political reaction if someone says, I won't stand for the national anthem? Mm. I believe, let's say, let, let's say you're, 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 you're a grieving family from Grenfell mm. and you want to address the you know, injustice that you've seen around that. How does how will politicians do you think react? Because he's taken a side. He's taken mm. a side that is the side, if you like, of the nation state mm. against what you would have thought of as the constitutional side of freedom of expression. Mm. But I just wondered, a whether you think that's right, whether you think we're trying to answer cultural questions mm. with economic answers, and b what do you think about this? You know, the extent to which the the icons of the nation state mm. are going to be challenged by people who feel mm. disenfranchised or excluded by it. Well, I think there's, there's so much to unpack there. I think the first thing is, you're absolutely right, um, uh, Trump loves waging a culture war. Um, uh, it's, it's what he's um, most relaxed doing. He did it during the campaign over transgender lose. Um, and uh, at every point, what he's trying to say is, uh, there's a politically correct minority that doesn't love America as you and I do. I'm on your side. And indeed, it's worked for Republicans in the past. Um, you know, one of the reasons why Richard Nixon um, managed to do so well in the late 60s and early 70s is that the rise of black power radicalism and campus radicalism through the weathermen and all the rest of it provided an atmosphere of disorder Normally, if you're running from the right, you want to say, I can maintain good order. We've got a calm um, uh, and orderly society. But actually, it helped Nixon to be able to say, you know, the, uh, the quiet majority are having their views mocked and their values mm. undermined. In the same way, Trump knows that taking the knee for the national anthem or anti-far protesters, um, you know, marshalling in opposition to what's been happening in Charlottesville, he can present that as people who are other to the majority of Americans. And it, and it, and it fits in with his view that you can make America great again really by bringing back the sorts of things that were familiar with America for Americans in the 50s, 60s, and 70s as symbols of their, uh, their growth, greatness, and power. So that's why he's pro-coal, pro-automobiles, pro the military. 
you know, he wants a, a John Wayne style America. And what do you think of the politics of it, Mike? Because obviously there, there's, you know, mm. you know, so, so I, I know that it must be slightly exhausting, but mm. what the hell, let's do it nonetheless, you know, to, to draw these parallels between mm. Trump and leave. And, yes. the, and, and one of the questions is the extent to which there is a, there is a cultural, mm. you know, dog whistle or in fact direct mm. call that, that Trump is making mm. that you think either needs to be made or is being made in the UK? Well, I think that the, 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 uh, there, are, there are obvious similarities between um, what happened in the referendum and what happened with um, Trump. I, I also think that there are similarities when you look at what happened with Syriza and Podemos and, uh, you know, that there are, in essence, since 2007, 2008, the overwhelming majority of people um, in the developed West have not got uh, any better off. Um, and that discontent has found expression in a variety of different ways. And I remember being told during the referendum campaign that um, uh, a Labour Remain campaigner was answering some cultural concerns with an economic argument and pointing out that uh, GDP had been rising in the UK over the last however many quarters and that GDP was projected to, uh, to fall if people voted to leave. And there was a cry from the back, and I can't do a Geordie accent, so I won't attempt to. Yeah, your bloody GBP, not mine. And the argument there in that phrase is, you talk about uh, abstract economics, but you're part of the class that's benefited from uh, everything that's been happening over the course of the last 20 years, me not. And I think for um, uh, working class voters, uh, the, the experience, not just of the last uh, uh, nine or ten years, but for longer, has been uh, institutions in which they can take pride. Mm -hmm. From um, uh, the, the heavy industries of the past, shipbuilding, mining, and all the rest of it, have got male confidence, which was attached to uh, uh, bringing home the bacon by being the breadwinner in those institutions, has taken a battering. And at the same time, there's a feeling that there's been a cultural condescension towards parts of the country, even as they've suffered economically. And on top of that, they also feel that um, uh, the Labour Party, um, in, in, in the most prominent expression of Tony Blair, um, took their votes, sucked up to the wealthy, and then Blair himself went on a journey after having <laughs> taken us into uh, what they would have thought of as a, a, a disastrous war in Iraq and one in Afghanistan in which it's white working class boys who bear the brunt of it. He then goes off and becomes the... Uh, uh, the friend and the plaything of potentates and um, mm. um, uh, uh, authoritarian billionaires. And all of that together, I think, created a sense from which, yes, there was a willingness to say, well, if the political establishment are going to say vote remain, then it's in their interest, not mine. And also, I think it created support, not for Corbyn and McDonald per se, as individuals, but for a shift left on the part of Labour, so that the Labour Party was talking more about traditional redistribution at the last election in a way that found a resonance. So I, I think that, I mean, going back to this sort of mm. theme we were setting out on about politicians and journalists and trust, mm. I, I'm really interested in the, in the, in the anatomy of trust mm. in particular. And if you think about what we're saying is that Trump, mm. when he set out, was happy to be mm. a little loose, literally. Mm. Not mm. so interested in the facts, but did want to get taken mm. seriously. If you think about the impact of these cultural wars, mm. is of course, it's a, it's a politics and a media mm. that is willing to be quite divisive, mm. I mean, very divisive. And, and I'm not trying to say this is a, no, no, no. a politician-made problem or mm -hmm. a media duck problem. There, there's obviously a, a way in which the one reinforces the other. There, there was one moment uh, when, when and actually this was six, seven years ago now, I remember, we were doing some focus groups, mm. uh, just to your Labour point, and uh, we had a group of people, and um, the report came back to me about what, what had come up in this focus group, and um, people were asking about, I asked about Ed Miliband, and someone said, uh, look, I just don't like Ed Miliband, and I don't like his brother Red Balls much either. <laughs> and, and, and I remember feeling, Actually, there's something rather wise in that, which yes. is, you know, that feeling. It's, I've, just, I've, just, I've just given up on the, on the whole lot of them. I think the, the thing that, that interests me now about what you're seeing in political parties, which I don't think mm. we had seen even as recently as five years ago, 
was the return of this polarization mm. within political parties. You know, if it, at the BBC, one of the things we spend a lot of time th really thinking and working through is the business of impartiality. You know, mm. how do you make sure you have a balance on a, or, on a panel in a series of interviews? And one of the things that's changed, of course, is that you're na you've now got polarization not simply between the parties, but within them. And one of the key characteristics of, of differences of opinion within parties is they're, they're, they're like the differences of opinion within families. They're much more keenly fought and fiercely yeah. held than arguments between neighbours or friends, mm. arguments between other parties. And we're seeing this reinforced in the media too. So you've got the Guardian and the Canary on the left. We were talking a little earlier mm. about, let's say, the Telegraph and Guido Fawkes on the right. And I wondered... When you think about the Conservative Party, mm. whether you think that what you're seeing, likewise in the States, this politics of division within the party is a permanent feature or just a sort of accident of the EU referendum and the nature of the current leadership? I think that um, it, it's, it's partly of our time, but you, the, the, it was the case, for example, in the 1980s, that you had a division between wets and dries that characterised Margaret Thatcher's uh, cabinet and, and there, there were preceding divisions, for example, over questions like decolonization in, in Macmillan's cabinet. Um, but um, one of the things that I do sympathize with you um, over is the fact that there is now a far greater degree of scrutiny over how balanced uh, any panel might be. So on question time, it's not simply the case that you have to have uh, uh, Labour and Conservative represented, you also have to think, uh, how does the leave remain balance, Lupia? And, do you, do you and, and, and of course the gender balance, and of course if we're going to have people who are cultural figures, uh, whether they're comedians, actors, uh, or whatever, how do we um, meld all of that together? And uh, you know, one of the problems is that sometimes in an effort to ensure that you have all of those constituencies represented, what you actually get is not necessarily a great conversation. You just have the setting out of people's pitched positions, mm. and so question time becomes, going back to what we were talking about earlier, an opportunity for people to recycle the sound bites that have been prepared for them well before. Do you, do you feel as though you're in the minority in the cabinet? Um, well, I suppose I'm, I'm. Liam and I are the only two. No, David Mandel. There are three Scots, so yes, I suppose we are. In the minority. <laughs> <laughs> um, And I do want to talk about that more. Yes, of course. <laughs> Leavers? Well, the interesting thing there is, um, as, as the Prime Minister um, uh, was asked this question earlier this week, so two were two of my other Cabinet colleagues, Jeremy Hunt and Liz Truss, who both said that had the referendum you know, been rerun, they would both have voted to leave. So it's difficult to know... Hold on, hold on. Liz Truss and Jeremy Hunt said yes. they would have voted to leave. Exactly. Not the Prime Minister. Not the Prime Minister. No. Not the Prime Minister. Um, Little fact check. Indeed. Yeah. Um, and I think that, it, therefore, it's difficult to know, because I haven't asked all of my colleagues were, you know, that, that hypothetical question. I think the Prime no, Minister, no, by the way, was wise to resist answering it, because I think that she's in a unique position, having to uh, lead a party and a country in which you have strong feelings on either side. And I think that um, uh, she was wise in, um, uh, in saying exactly what she did. But I don't know what the true balance of opinion is now within the cabinet or within the Conservative Party. So the, the reason I ask is, I'm, I mean, we're, uh, I'm going to tell a slightly indiscreet story. So in the run-up to the election earlier this year, mm. that heaven knows there have been a few, so it's this mm. year's one, in, in, uh, um, uh, we were headed to somewhere for York. Mm. York? Was York where we did the question time? With the Prime Minister? I think so, yes. Yes. Oh, maybe, was it me, York, was it Nottingham? No, no anyway, York. whatever, York. 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 So yeah. I'm on a train to York, mm -hmm. and as I'm mm. walking, as we're pulling to York Station, the heavy mob, mm. right, is uh, preparing to get off the train, because, mm. of course, uh, as you may know, when we do those question times, mm. um, sort of a chunk of the cabinet comes up to mob the assembled press crew oh, and yes. make sure that... Uh, mm -hmm. We get the "quote unquote" right message and appreciate the right result mm. of the uh, uh, of the. In this case, a question time. It was, as you may remember, they chose not to debate. They wouldn't uh, debate, so it was a one-on-one -on -one, uh, question mm. time with the prime minister and the audience. And um, uh, the, uh, Boris Johnson was uh, there, and there were a number of other uh, cabinet ministers. I won't uh, say who, but but as they were getting off the train, 
Um, one of them turned to Boris and said, come on, Boris, we've got to go off and spend that 350 million, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I thought, yeah. <laughs> I thought, this must be a hilarious and at the same time not so funny dynamic <laughs> within the cabinet where people are thinking about the budget cuts they face mm. and this ongoing debate about uh, the money that may or may not be available mm. as a result of leaving the European Union. And... I suppose I did want to draw a line from the the issues around being taken, you know, seriously mm. but not literally. If you think back to your news editing days, mm. Michael, and you were thinking about that number, three hundred and fifty mm. million, what would be the terms under which you think res it should responsibly be used? Well, I think uh, it's it's the sum which the I and mean, here we we enter a. Uh, Linguistic and terminological minefield, but I'll try and um, foxtrot my way through it. Um, the, the, the someone would say we didn't enter it. No, 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 no. It's, it's, uh, we, we, I um, made the point that this was the amount of money that was controlled by the European Union. Yes, um, and we also tried to make it clear that um, once we took back control, our particular um, uh, uh, slogan of choice or uh, rallying call of choice, then some of that money. 100 million was the, the, the specific sum, would go to the NHS. One of the striking things is there are two aspects of the campaign of which I'm constantly reminded by people who uh, weren't necessarily overjoyed by the outcome. Um, one is uh, 350 million pounds, which they confidently assert we'd always said was for the NHS. And the other is um, something that I said when I was being interviewed by Faisal Islam, which is um, I think people in this country have had enough of experts he then interrupted, because of course it was too good an opportunity not to miss, because <laughs> as, as, as half sentences go, that's pretty out there. I then went on to say, from organisations with acronyms who've got things wrong in the past, because he was asking me, you know, the IMF and the IFS mm -hmm, all say mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. um, uh, there'll be a recession after uh, you vote to leave, so uh, why don't you take them seriously? You don't mm -hmm. have anyone on your side. Um, at the time, both the £350 million pounds and the experts line got some pushback, but it didn't become electric. It became electric afterwards because people who uh, were either disappointed with or regretful um, for the result uh, wanted to argue, some did, not all, A, that the um, result was won by um, uh, statistical leisure demand on the one hand, um, and by an appeal to base ignorance on the other. And I think that that risks for the Remain side of the argument, repeating the same mistake that was made during the campaign, which is not to pay sufficient respect to voters. And I think that the suggestion that some make that, that um, the election campaign was, sorry, the referendum campaign was won by deception, um, and that uh, it was won by um, uh, a deliberate, know-nothing, anti-expert stance, I think misreads why people voted as they did. But people were, you, you know, for. But people will listen to that, Michael, and for all the, the, the eloquence and reasonableness of it, I think people look, there are two elisions that you make there. Mm. The first one is that there's £350 million that's mm. controlled mm. by the European Union, and then the first elision is to say, and what we made clear was that £100 million of it mm. would go to the NHS, leaving a question which is, well then why was it not 100 million that was being debated mm. rather than 350 million? I, there was a comfort mm. there with a, with a statistical mm. lightness of touch. And then the second illusion that you make is that those people who do, mm. you know, retrospectively question the number mm. are questioning the legitimacy of voters. Mm. But they, and I think, and the reason I think it is worth going back to is that one of the lasting impacts mm. of the referendum over and above the nature of the UK's relationship with the EU mm. is going to be this, this sense of deep anger, as I say, mm. both towards politicians and, and the media, about the extent to which facts have been mm. debased in public life. And I guess I, f from our point of view, it became pretty lively very quickly, mm. that number because it wasn't just that it was being used mm. in debate, right? When, when, we, when someone was on air, mm. there was a sense that it could be challenged. Do you remember mm. yeah, you yeah. Know, Evan Davis on Newsnight really went after it? Yes. What was, the, what was really interesting, of course, was what did you do with pictures when it was on the side of the bus? Mm. And I remember having a, a discussion pretty quickly saying we had to make sure we positioned our cameras mm. so that we weren't essentially using that as a slogan, wallpaper mm. on our TV coverage, 
chiefly because while it was an argument of mm. the Leave campaign, it was an argument that couldn't have a right of reply when mm. it was being used as wallpaper. The, the, the thing that I come back to is whether or not you feel, putting aside the, mm. the, the principles you obviously felt very strongly about leaving, whether or not you thought that particular tactic has a long-term impact in terms of trust and politicians on the business of facts. Well, I think the number was, and I remember appearing on um, uh, a question time with David Dimbleby and the studio audience on a programme with Faisal Islam on a variety of different platforms and being challenged about it and giving a defence of it, which um, uh, in the end meant that there was nowhere for Faisal or for David left to go because I, I unpacked each of the, the elements of the 350 million. Uh, and I, uh, to this day, uh, think that people light on it from, from one side of the argument because they feel that somehow the electorate were duped. I think the other, th which I, I, I absolutely believe. No, absolutely. You think, you, you think that that was a sort of responsible use of numbers in politics? Yes, because um, it's now the case that people say, well, where is that £350 million? Pounds? And I make the point that um, since we haven't left the European Union, then we cannot perforce uh, uh, take back control of that money until the point when we have, and whenever we have. I mean, one of the reasons why the talks at the moment um, are, um, uh, haven't advanced as quickly as some might have hoped is because there's an argument over money. And the argument over money is based on the fact that the UK contributes a huge amount mm. to the EU's budget and EU nations like Germany, which are net contributors, uh, don't want that, uh, that hole suddenly to open up in front of them and they don't want that £350 million pounds, uh, being repatriated to the UK uh, sooner rather than later. There's another element as well, which is that um, I think that we will be spending um, uh, significantly more. We need to spend significantly more on the NHS in its own terms and I think that um, it's not illegitimate for um, politicians to argue that if we are going to have a dividend as a result of taking back this money, which manifestly EU nations would like us to continue paying in, that the NHS should be one of the priorities. Can I, can I ask a... Um, I'm, I'm sort of slightly aware of the fact mm. this is going to be a room with uh, strong, strong feelings. I should just say one thing about, uh, uh, about A, Michael, and B, my capacity to read a room, is that I was once... Um, uh, uh, at a session, I was, I don't know, we were talking about things. And for some reason, I took, sort of meandered off subject onto the great subject of Michael Gove. And I started launching into what a terrific experience I'd had with Michael. This was when we were at the Times, and we were investigating child sex grooming. And uh, there was an extraordinary journalist I worked with, a guy called Andrew Norfolk, mm. who worked for, it was actually turned out to be about 13 months before even the first story made it into the papers. And he was the one who drove the reporting. One of the obstacles we faced is that one of the councils we were investigating uh, injuncted us, injuncted the Times and prevented publication. And we heard that uh, this council had gone to the Secretary of State and was going to ask for the Secretary of State's uh, support in preventing publication of our, of our reporting. And the word came back that uh, the Secretary of State had indeed been consulted and uh, that the Secretary of State had decided, yes, that he would uh, intervene. This was when you were working with Dominic Cummings. The Secretary of State would intervene, but he was going to intervene on behalf of the Times and the importance of this uh, uh, publication. And I told this story, actually chilled at the memory of what uh, uh, an important act that was in the nature of our coverage, to an entirely stony-faced room of teachers. Uh, and it was only when I realised that I was pitching this to the wrong room that uh, I realised how, uh, how difficult life can be. And as you were talking about the case for the EU, I did suddenly think that this may not be overwhelmingly a, a you know, a, uh, a vote leave room. Uh, and so... The almost, every, almost every room is overwhelmingly <laughs> a vote leave room. And so the reason I wanted to talk about that was how do you think... You know, we talk about mm. the impacts on facts, we talk about polarisation, mm. we talk about the changes to our politics mm. driven by slogans. Your life now is about trying to deliver a, a, a government, a Brexit, mm. that tries to bring together a country that has been mm. very divided. And I suspect, Michael, that you personally have more profound experience of that 
the rupture in your relationship with David Cameron, uh, to an extent, probably less so with George Osborne, do you think these are div divisions and differences that can heal either the personal ones or the national ones? And if so, what, sh what should be done to make that happen? Well, on a national basis, um, as I think that, um, uh, I don't think, well, I, mean, I could be wrong, I don't think people are that interested in uh, politicians' own personal relationships. Unless I think they, you are wrong about that. And, unless they stray into the... <laughs> unless they Anyone stray into, to want to talk? Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> unless they stray into the, uh, 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 the criminal or subversive. Um, on a national level, I think that the thing is that the, the, the referendum laid bare some divisions that already existed mm. and, I, and which I think had been underappreciated and underestimated. And you know, in essence, I think that... Um, uh, a variety of things that have been um, happening in this country over the course of, of the last 10 or 15 years have distanced um, uh, uh, the, the north from the south, uh, the metropolis, London, from the rest of the country, uh, the old from the young, and the rich from the poor, and things like, for example, quantitative easing something that had to happen. Mm -hmm. um, you mm -hmm. know, it, was the, it was the equivalent of um, applying the appropriate drug after uh, uh, our economy had had a heart attack. We're still on that drug. And it has resulted in yeah. uh, the rich becoming richer um, uh, and uh, allied to the fact that banks had to be bailed out because their function in supplying credit couldn't be mm -hmm. provided by anyone else. But the fact that you have people who um, are receiving hundreds of thousands of pounds in remuneration while running a bank that is owned by taxpayers, all of these things accumulate and all of these things I think are part of a, uh, uh, a generation of division in society which went beyond simply the 52-48 division at the referendum. And there is a responsibility to, to do that. And I think, curiously, some might say, but I think um, uh, uh, Theresa May, in the words that she spoke when she entered Downing Street, I think recognised that more effectively than almost any other politician at the time. And then, uh, I can well imagine you think that what is not clear to me is then why you end up with a... There, there's a fork in the road, isn't there, for the government, which is mm. a Brexit for everyone, mm -hmm. and a Brexit means Brexit. Mm. And what's unclear to me is why pursue the, the, the Brexit means Brexit, which mm. is a... People take as a shorthand mm. that there will be no compromises, no dilutions. Mm. What, what, what does not appeal to you about a Brexit for everyone um, approach, both in the political positioning of it and in the substance of it? Well, I think that, um, <coughs> for once, I'm, I'm, I don't know that I would necessarily recognise that, um, that division. When people talk about soft or hard, mm. um, and one of the things that um, uh, I think you encounter when you're outside London is that people are irritated that Brexit hasn't happened yet. <laughs> and one of the things that um, I found during the general election campaign, I was a backbencher at the time, um, and therefore knocking on people's doors and visiting parts of the country which we, where we hoped to win seats, um, people would say, well, we voted a year ago. Why haven't we left? So I absolutely take your point, which is that for some, uh, the most important thing would be to uh, secure uh, a result at the end of this negotiating process that was closer to... Um, uh, the rights and obligations that we have as an EU membership. Mm -hmm. But there are other people who would feel um, a sense of disappointment and or anger if we didn't um, have a real and observable change as a result. So the, 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 the Brexit for everyone that you mentioned, um, I think is going to be um, a difficult thing to define for the reasons that you alluded to earlier, because there are different expectations. Uh, that people have about what life outside the European Union will bring, and how much you know. One of the things that one of the things that we find ourselves that, that that's actually very difficult. It's difficult in I think in most newsrooms these mm. days. You know, as I, as I often say to people, um, partly uh, for effect, mm. but in no small part because I really think it that th there are half a dozen um, really big issues that we're mm. facing technology disruption, mm. the fact people are living longer, what's happening mm. in terms of exactly, as you say, inequality mm. in terms of, you know, acceleration mm. of global capitalism. What are we going to do about identity and free expression? Mm. You know, Brexit is not necessarily 
the most important political issue we face. Mm. And the opportunity cost, the fact that we're spending so much time thinking and working on that at the expense of other things, mm. how does the how does the government, how does society organise itself so we can, you know, if you like, get on with the serious work? Well, I think I think that the, the two are interlinked. But one of the striking things, again, about um, having been a journalist and having been a politician is that um, uh, so much of my day as a, as a minister is absorbed with things which um, uh, would never generate or cause excitement um, um, for <laughs> a news say, editor. Mark. What a shock. Yeah. No. So, so you know, most, of, most of the time, um, so I have uh, meetings to discuss how we're going to um, deal with a variety of Brexit scenarios. But some of those meetings are um, about um, the significant opportunities that exist to reform agriculture or to reform fisheries policy. And we'd be having um, conversations about agriculture and fisheries policy anyway. Um, uh, we'd be con considering how uh, big data and tech can change the way in which agriculture works. We're thinking about that in the context of other new opportunities. But lots of the meetings that I have about either regulation of water companies or um, rewilding in parts of the country are conversations that, that we would have had anyway. No, but, I suppose I think... But, but because, because of the sort of business as usual element mm. is not the area that people see as, as, a, as a source of drama, yeah. um, it doesn't get covered in the same way. So the headspace that people think that Brexit takes for each departmental minister is, is less than the media, uh, what's the word, uh, preoccupation. Understandable preoccupation. No, no, the I, I, Frolof, I meant it actually from a political sense, because mm. I think, you know, going back to this, this sort of mm. theme, politics, journalists, trust, mm. one, of the, one of the issues that I think has the potential to rebound on both in mm. a very negative way is the sense that, that people are consumed by what's shrill and noisy mm. and ignoring what's important and... There'll be many people who would think, mm. how is it possible these two guys can be sitting here and not talked about climate change for whatever mm. it is, half an hour, 40 minutes? Mm. And is it the sense that, that, that Brexit and the politics of Trump are sucking up your oxygen and taking it away from something that is much more important? And I just wondered, mm. in your relatively new job, whether you feel as though the appetite for the government to be seen to be a very an activist mm. on climate change has changed. Well, I, you'll know the figures, but I think it's the case that Countryfile yes. gets more viewers than the news. It, uh, some days. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I just want to be obviously no, even-handed. Uh, yes, no, but my, my, um, the thing is that Countryfile um, talks about all of these issues. Um, and it does so in a way which, of course, on a, I know that on, um, in television terms, on a Sunday evening, people enjoy seeing beautiful scenery. Yes. Whether it's Downton Abbey, Monarch of the Glen, or Country File, there is a visual element, yeah. or the Blue Planet, whatever. Um, but it's also the case that there is a genuine interest in these subjects. And the striking thing, again, in political terms, is that during the course of the, the general election, as a constituency MP, mm. I had people writing in, sending me emails, and uh, petitioning me to support various campaigns. Environmental concerns and animal welfare concerns were the overwhelming, 80% yes. um, uh, bulk of, of, of the things that I received. So in that sense, I think you may be right. But, but I think part of it is... Um, Many of those who make decisions, I'm exempting you, um, about what is news mm. tend to be people who've studied uh, history or social science at um, a Russell Group University and therefore have a particular set of values, preoccupations yeah. and interests. And they tend, exclus not exclusively, but overwhelmingly, to come from uh, uh, the southeast or one of our major cities and so in that sense, when it comes to all our media, mainstream media, reflecting the issues and covering the debates in which people are mm. interested, there tends to be a bias towards what people like Morris Cowling would have called high politics. Yeah. Um, and so there tends to be, you know, congresses, people getting out of uh, limos in, in Brussels with a fusillade of light bulbs going off. That tends to lead the news alongside conflict Mm -hmm. and, and it's much more difficult, we all know, to find a way to have a newsy take on AI mm -hmm. without turning it into a Blade Runner or a, or, or a sophisticated examination of climate change without using the same footage of uh, polar bears on ice floes. For, for what it's worth, we, those two subjects 
um, AI and actually quantitative easing. Yes. I remember about a year after I joined the BBC, I came in, I'd, I'd read um, mm. one of those uh, uh, great books, the Bryn Olufsen book on, yes. uh, on the future of computing and robotics. Incredibly excited. I walked in and said, you know, this is it. We're going to do this. We're going to do intelligent machines and we're going to spread it through for a week. And, you know, people reluctantly but cheerfully mm. got on and did exactly that. And then about six months later, yeah. um, I said, you know, we really have to do something about what's happened in the world of low interest rates. We've mm -hmm. got to do something about what does the world of low interest rates mean to people? And mm. we sort of had a crack at that. And a few months after that, I was about to open my mouth and suggest another brilliant idea when, <laughs> when a producer very helpfully pointed me and said, do you think it would be possible this time to have an idea that's actually got some pictures? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so I've been very, trying to be very careful. Yes. Uh, and I only mention that story because, the, uh, you know, Michael's obviously right that one of the things that is a real impact, particularly on television news, is how do you marry what are the really long-term developments with, a, with, mm. with areas where, you know, events have really, have really strong pictures. C can I um, ask you, I know we're going to, I don't know what our time is, we've got time, yes. time for a little bit more. Yes. So I, I, I do want to go back to the personal. Yes. Right, because um, your m many people find it amazing that you're all sitting around the cabinet yes. table. Um, they find it amazing that I'm there at all. Yes, they, they, many people <laughs> feel that way. Yes, no, that's true. And I imagine that you include yourself in that. You, you betcha. <laughs> um, are there? Do, do you think that all of the Let's go back to the personal mm. ones. Um, I'm sure they're life only lessons. If only if I can ask you one question in okay. a second. Okay, fine. Yeah. All right. Oh, no, it doesn't sound good at all. <laughs> now, um, uh, Boris? Mm. Fine? Uh, I know you're going to go through a whole host <laughs> of individual No, I'm not. I'm only going to do yeah. two. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, yes is the short answer. <laughs> Okay. Cameron? Um, since David is no longer in politics, I will respect his privacy by not saying anything on that subject. <laughs> is there a difference between a short answer and a long answer like that? Uh, on Boris, the, the, <laughs> I can say yeah. so much, I'm the, yeah. but, but um, I, I'll, I'll leave the audience to follow it up in the questions which we're going to hand over to uh, them to ask in a moment. All right, but yours? My, my question. How true to life is W1A? <laughs> Well, I have to, con I have to confess uh, it is that I haven't seen them all. Mm. In fact, I've seen relatively few because it was too painful. <laughs> um, but I remember seeing um, one of the very first and the director of news character, as far as mm -hmm. I can see, the only thing the director of news mm -hmm. does is sit in a meeting, look uncomfortable, have the phone go, say, oh, bollocks, fuck, excuse me, I've got to leave the meeting. <laughs> So extremely <laughs> lifelike okay. uh, um, <laughs> and very well observed. The extraordinary thing, the absolutely extraordinary thing, I think, about W1A, and it sort of says something uh, about the miracle of uh, creativity mm. and artistic work, is that I met uh, the, the person who writes it uh, a couple of months ago. And, of course, you remember he uh, wrote 2012 as mm. well. And things are absolutely amazing about him. He's never worked in an office in his life. He's never worked in an organisation. And mm -hmm. the fact that he can intuit quite so yes. much, not least about the, the, you know, the terrible things that good people mm. like us have done to the English language, uh, is, mm. is amazing. So um, uh, what's the, the short answer is yes, much too much. Okay. <laughs> um, we have time for questions. If people want to ask James anything, me something, both of us, um, all sorts. Um, the gentleman there in the, in the dark blue shirt. Station guys, really interesting. Uh, I don't think I'm the only conservative supporter in the room with young, young adult children that plan on voting for Jeremy, much to my dismay as a father. Um, J'accuse, Michael, you and your colleagues for screwing up the last election, wasting time talking about grammar schools and fox hunting <laughs> and handing over to Jeremy what seems to be an, an open goal. By the way, just to say, if you ever want a job, 
You're hired. <laughs> um, the short answer is yes. Um, but uh, I think that the, the right answer is to um, take a little bit of time, not too much, draw all the appropriate lessons from that. And one of the things that I don't think that we should do is uh, suddenly abandon, for example, the belief that um, when it comes to university finance, that w whether you, you know, whatever w method we have in the future, it is the case that if individuals themselves go to university and then enjoy the sort of career where they're earning more than they otherwise would, then they should bear some of the costs alongside the rest of society. And, and similarly, I think that we shouldn't, um, uh, because of Corbyn and McDonald's popularity, think that um, we, um, because they are offering unvarnished, as it were, 80s socialism, that we should offer um, a re retrofitted 80s Thatcherism. You know, the, 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 the economic challenges have changed since then. So we should be, um, uh, in both senses of the word, we shouldn't either lurch too far in trying to, um, um, uh, what's the word, um, meet the Corbynites on their territory, nor should we try to think that we can win by only repeating arguments that worked when we were young. Um, and that is a particular challenge, and it's one that all those of us sitting around the cabinet table who do bear that responsibility that you mentioned are thinking hard about now. Yes, thanks. I'd like to come back to your comment about, or your the quote about the uh, experts. Um, I, I'd like to ask, do you believe in evidence-based policy? And if not, then even if it's, you know, people with acronyms who've got things wrong in the past, what's the alternative if we don't listen to experts? Is it to listen to people who don't know what they're talking about? Well, um, by definition, um, the... A, um if I look back at the variety of things that I've done in government, then uh, evidence-based policy making has been at the heart of it. Everything from introducing um, a systematic synthetic phonics check at the age of six in order to make sure that children were reading fluently, through to um, the school food plan, which um, ensured that children were going to have um, uh, the nutritious and appropriately sourced food that they would need in order to uh, learn uh, throughout the day. If you um, want, I suppose, evidence for my approach towards evidence, then I would cite, of all things, David Law's uh, History of the Coalition and his diaries, which shows that during that period when I was at education, that was the approach we took. Similarly, when I was at Justice, without wanting to sort of, you know, bang my own drum too much, um, we argued that we needed to reduce the prison population because that was, um, uh, it was simply impossible to deliver rehabilitative activity with the prison population at the level that it, it was, and that you ended up crowding out the, um, uh, literally crowding out the energy required and the focus required in order to change people's lives for the better. But my particular point was um, a point in the moment about the tendency that some have to say, if this organization takes this view, then we must uncritically accept it. And there is no field where people are more likely to get things wrong, even the most gifted, than economic forecasting. And one of the things about uh, uh, the IMF is that they were uh, good enough, not um, as a result of anything I said, but because of objective factors, to revisit some of what they'd said about the single currency and to say that they had suffered from confirmation bias and uh, from uh, uh, many of the traits to which all of us as human beings are prone when we come to believe uh, that a version of events that reinforces our own initial assumptions is the version of events to which we will cling come what may. Well, there's lots and lots of questions, to be fair. So do you want to take Michael round the back afterwards? No. Go, go, is that right? Do you, do you regret saying it? I, mean, do you... I, I, regret, I regret the way in which it was presented as somehow an, an attack on all experts, because um, uh, that's certainly not my view. But I do have and did have some criticisms of economic forecasting and the institutions that attempt to say, you will definitely have result A if you do action B in the field of economics. A uh, question to, to James. James, you're leaving the BBC to set up your own venture. 
um, and you want to set up an opinion-based uh, media company, as I understand it. A lot of people might find it slightly, um, slightly concerning. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, other BBC uh, news people, for example, Craig Oliver, when he left to go to work with David Cameron, was marched out the door on the first day that he announced he was leaving. Um, you're going to be staying as head of news when really the cornerstone of BBC is to be impartial. Exactly. Uh, and yet you said already that you're going to set up a media company that yeah. is not going to be impartial. How do you square that? It's a, it's a really good question, and we've, and we've thought, uh, thought and talked a fair bit about it. So it's not to be an opinion, uh, opinion-based media company, just to be clear. In fact, I haven't said that... We'd all love to hear more about exactly. it. Exactly, and, and I've actually been uncharacteristically coy about it, precisely because um, you know, uh, I need to do the job I'm in until the end of the year. The, the thing, and Andy Ma, Andrew Ma said something I thought really sensible, which is that, you know, if you come out of a different news organisation, you join the BBC, you basically leave your opinions at the door. And I think that's a requirement, that's absolutely right. And, and what I've done is I continue to do that, and I will sort of see how they're looking when I, when I leave. But, but if you've already the, decided to set up a company, yes. opinion-based media, then, then clearly you've still got your opinions somewhere. Well, uh, just, to, just to be clear, I think that everyone, I think it would be extremely odd if people who worked for the BBC, in fact many others who work in other forms of uh, walks in life, didn't have opinions. We know people have opinions. The question is how, what you do with them in your working life. And the requirement, I think, on us in the BBC is to make sure that we're, ex we, we're not just careful but assiduous in, in fulfilling that requirement of impartiality. And that's what, that's what I'm setting out to do, which is precisely the reason why I'm not talking about the things that I'm going to do, uh, uh, do when I leave. But you're absolutely right. The thing that's the consideration for me now, between now and the time I leave, is that we continue to do that, particularly at a time when you know, the mood you know, in the country and audiences generally is so polarised and people are quick to assume that there is a hidden agenda or some opinion lurking, uh, lurking there. But I think that it's the case that you know, many people have come from outside into the BBC and worked, and many people have gone on from the BBC to go and do other things in, you know, in all walks of life, that some of them political, as you mentioned, some of them you know, with opinions uh, in the media. I think what's important is what you do while you're at the BBC. Yeah, yes, the gentleman. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Eat it. Um, thank you both. I really enjoy the conversation, um, as I have with all the other ones today. Um, but regarding the next election, uh, well as the snap election that we have just had, um, in terms of criticising uh, the Labour Party and the far more socialist ideology that is following in recent memory rather than the uh, new Labour ideology of uh, previous politicians like Gordon Brown and such, uh, why wasn't there, uh, do you think, such little historical criticism of the socialist ideology in the election and surely telling young voters, well, if you look at Venezuela, you look at countries that have inputted this kind of ideology, these are the historical effects. Why was it more about little bickering points rather than actually looking at historical examples? And so, so are, you asking, are you asking in terms of the, the media scrutiny or the political campaign? Well, the, the, um, um, I'm not convinced, though, you know, I, I, th I think there is a place for saying, um, look, we've gone down some of these tracks before and it hasn't necessarily ended up in an entirely happy place. But um, uh, the, the, one of the things about the Labour Manifesto um, uh, is that um, there was both guile in the way in which Labour leaked it, so they had a double hit. And while many uh, people on the right thought, <gasps> fantastic that it's been leaked because it's a sort of socialist wish list. There are plenty of people who, who read it and thought, nationalising the rail companies, fantastic. Nationalising the water companies, well, given how much they're me, absolutely spot on. Wiping out student debt, whoa So the, 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 the critical thing is that um, while you are right that um, we've seen this movie before and we know how it ends, nevertheless... If you run an election campaign as Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell did with a degree of positivity and energy, which reflects where mm, public opinion is, maybe it shouldn't be, but where it is, then certain things flow. And I think the critical thing is when Corbyn himself 
was challenged by Paxman about why in your manifesto is there no commitment to get rid of the royal family. We all know that you're a revolutionary. The fact that he could smile serenely and say, well, there are, you know, all sorts of things you can, could have had in there, Jeremy, but in fact, what we're doing is X, Y, and Z. Corbyn knew then that Jeremy Paxman was being um, an objective friend of the revolution because what he was doing was um, taking out the, uh, the skeleton in the closet and Jeremy Corbyn was able to sort of whisk it away and then get the focus back on not what might have been deemed to have been his extreme record, but on the uh, far more attractive and mainstream prospectus that he was putting forward. And for what it's worth, I think the, I think the, I think you're absolutely right to raise the question of the extent to which we are debating really profound choices about how we run the economy. But the criticism runs both ways. It runs both the extent to which we think the issues that are existing in the state are properly uh, interrogated by our, our journalism, and also the extent to which uh, free market capitalism is having the outcomes, not just you know globally, that people have talked about for the last 25 years, but within our country. So I do think, I think it's a completely legitimate uh, question. I, I would say, if anything, the risk is that there's too much talk about politicians in terms of certain, you know, to Michael's point, uh, you know, slogans or badges. Actually, the interesting thing is when you get to debate the specific policies, um, you know, what politicians say and what the public thinks. And I have to say that in that sense, what was really, really striking about the 2017 election was that for as much as our, our clip on the opening night uh, interviewed a voter in Bristol whose response was, oh no, not another <laughs> election, I can't face it. Actually, what we saw were incredibly high levels of engagement, really high turnout, and a lot of interest in the substance of the policies. So, curiously, I think there is a level of engagement in the choices that, that we're facing, and that's you know, across the political spectrum. I fear we've hit the buffers time-wise. Um, there's another session in here at 3.30 when we will be discussing some of the themes that uh, we touched on here um, with uh, real experts. Um, <laughs> Uh, and by the way, I should say also with an extraordinary chair, Sarah Vine. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> so um, um, uh, Anne McElvoy from The Economist, Stephen Pollard, um, uh, uh, the editor of The Jewish Chronicle, Kwasi Kwarteng, uh, 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 Parliamentary Private Secretary to the Chancellor of the Exchequer, um, among others. So it's a uh, fantastic lineup. So I hope I'll see you in half an hour's time for that panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>